Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? The book of Colossians chapter 3, third division of the book of Colossians is where we're going to begin today. And while you're opening your Bible and getting settled, we welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being with our church family. This holiday weekend brings visitors to us from a variety of places. And for that, we are always very, very grateful. And this holiday weekend takes many of our members away. We, as we said in the email yesterday, we have members literally scattered throughout the United States today. And we pray that all will be safe. But we are extremely happy that you're with us. Wonderful to have you with us. We appreciate those who helped us worship this morning very much. Kevin's good prayer and Matthew's reading for us, Andy's song direction, and appreciate Brian's communion meditation. Brian uh, filled in with communion meditation at the last moment. If you've looked at your family report this morning, read the email yesterday, you know that Jonathan is supposed to be preaching this morning, and I'm not Jonathan. Now, we do look remarkably alike. I know that, but uh, I'm I'm just, I'm not, I'm not Jonathan. Uh, Yesterday evening, Vicki and I were going to driving to have dinner with some friends and uh, got a text from Jonathan saying he was under the weather, didn't know if he'd be able to make it this morning. I thought, well, that's, that's okay. But then later in the evening, I got a text that said, hey, I'm feeling a little better. I think, I think we'll be good to go. And then got a text this morning that said, <clears throat> not good to go at all. And, uh, and so uh, I, I get, to, get to fill in for JV this morning. This, by the way, is not the shortest notice that I've ever had for preaching by, by any stretch of the imagination. The shortest notice that I ever had for preaching was a few years ago. Vicki and I were on vacation. We were going to be visiting with a church where a, a longtime friend of mine had preached, and I had not seen him in a long time, so I called him a couple of weeks before and said, hey, what time are your services? I said, there's a chance that Vicki and I are going to be there on that, on that day to worship with you. And he told me, and so <clears throat> we were there, and we were going to worship there, but... I did what preachers do. This is a little secret here. Preachers typically, when we're on vacation, uh, we, we, go to the, we go to the assembly after it's already started. We wait a few minutes after it started because we're on vacation. We don't have to preach that morning, right? And so I, we, I did what I always do. We, we, went, we went in late. And my friend was standing in the foyer, standing in the foyer, and he says, Don, Don, come on, come on. I said, come on for what? He said, Talk to the elders. They want you to preach. I've already announced your preaching this morning, and this is the song before the sermon. That was the notice that I had. I literally walked directly up the aisle and into the pulpit. Now, here was the sermon that morning. It is wonderful to be with you today. It's great to see all of you. And if you need to be baptized today or come home to your father, let's stand and sing. I think they liked it. I've been invited back a dozen times to that church. So... I'm glad to get to talk with you this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about what you see on the screen. Just a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in New Albany, Indiana, where I lived for many years, and I was asked, I was asked there to develop a sermon on this subject, Heaven Built by Christ. And I want to share those thoughts with you this morning as well. There are a lot of great songs <clears throat> about heaven. I appreciate Andy singing kind of at the last minute that song, Sing to Me of Heaven. We have sung that song countless times in our fellowship, haven't we, and in this church. There are other songs that we don't sing in our assembly and yet remind us of heaven. I've always loved the song, I Can Only Imagine. I like that song. I like the video with that song where there are the pictures of individuals, family members that have died, and you imagine what what they are seeing in the life that is beyond this life. There are a lot of things about which we can only imagine. We will never experience. I can only imagine what it was like on June the 20th, 1969, when Neil Armstrong stood on the lunar surface and looked back at our little blue planet. I can only imagine what that would be. I can only imagine what it's like for a surgeon the very first time that he cuts open a a chest of a human body and sees a beating human heart. What would that be like? Well, I don't know. I, I can only imagine what that would be like. I can only imagine what it was like. If you think about what was celebrated on June the 19th, this new national holiday, when finally the word had gotten all the way beyond Galveston, Texas, that that these slaves, these who had never known freedom, to to think what would it be like to be the first person in, in every generation of your family to know what it is to be truly free. I can only imagine. Well, there are a lot of things that would fall into that category. 
And yet there are a lot of things about which we don't have to imagine, wonderful things that, that we have been allowed to see. We've been allowed to see things like the brightness of a, of a grandchild's eyes. We, we've seen brides and grooms exchanging vows and starting a life together. We've seen children and grandchildren graduate from high school and college. We've seen lost souls in this building rise to walk in newness of life. We have seen as we celebrate today, purple mountains majesty from sea to shining sea. We have seen so very much, but all of that pales in comparison to heaven. Do you have your Bible this morning? Colossians 3, <clears throat> beginning in verse number 1. Paul says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, as he sits at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The key of that, of course, is verse 2. Set your mind on things above. The word set is the operative word there. It's a word that we would use in the 21st century to talk about a pilot who sets a course, who sets a course to reach a destination. And in this passage, he's saying, I want you to set your mind on things above. Think about things above. Focus on things above. Strive for things above. I want to ask you this morning, do you do that? And when you do, what do you expect about heaven? It was four, maybe five years ago, I wrote an article <clears throat> entitled Heaven's Top Ten. I wrote a little article about 10 things that we need to understand, 10 factual things that we need to understand about heaven. Let me pop them on the screen for you here very quickly. Number one, that heaven is in fact a real place. I know that's true because Jesus said, when you pray, say this, our Father who is in heaven. For Jesus, heaven was a real place. And so you have, you have statements not only like that in Matthew 6 and beginning in verse 9, but also in John 14, where Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. Heaven is God's home. It's not simply a feeling or an emotion or a transitory state. It's not just a state of mind. It is not a galaxy far, far away. The old time preachers used to say that heaven is a prepared place for the prepared people of God. Heaven is a real place. Secondly, heaven isn't like earth at all. There's a reason why the revelation begins in chapter four and beginning in verse one with these words being spoken to the apostle John, come up here and I will show you things that must be after this. And the reason that John had to come up there is because there is nothing on earth to compare with heaven. Here, we are bothered by so many things. We are bothered by weather and bugs and weather and crime and weather and traffic and weather and politics. And in Florida, weather and weather and more weather, but not in heaven. Here we take medicine for our sicknesses and we take naps for our weaknesses and we secure our houses with alarms and we grieve our losses at cemeteries, but not in heaven. Heaven isn't like that. It's why the revelation, God says, behold, I am making all things new. Number three, modern witnesses about heaven are bogus. This is important, ladies and gentlemen. Modern witnesses about heaven are bogus. In the last decade and a half, one of the most popular segments of the religion publishing industry focuses on individuals who claim that they have either died and come back from the death, or they've had a near-death experience, and in both cases, they are writing books about what they supposedly saw, which fascinates me. Because in 2 Corinthians 12, an inspired apostle who actually was given a glimpse into heaven wrote about that and said, you know what, what I saw, it is not lawful for me to say. I'm not allowed to tell you what I saw. And even those things that he says, it would be all right for me to say, he said, I can't even, I can't explain them. I can't even begin to describe them. They were so great. And yet these individuals who supposedly come from the dead, come back from the dead, they can't stop jabbering about it. They write and write and talk and talk. Why? Well, obviously they're trying to line their pockets. If you want to know about heaven, ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't read a book by somebody who's trying to line their pocket, simply open your Bible and read what God has revealed. Number four, not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody goes to heaven. 
I know it's not very popular to say that. I know that we live in an all-inclusive, everybody gets a trophy kind of world. But what did Jesus say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, you are my Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, at your funeral, let's be really honest today, at your funeral, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what a preacher says about your eternal state. The final arbiter of that is our God. And Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Number five, you don't become an angel when you die. You don't become an angel when you die. Now, <clears throat> angels are amazing beings and they have an amazing job to do. Their job description, Hebrews 1 and verse 14 is that they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those of us who are the heirs of salvation. And so angels do great things for those of us who are children of God. But when you die, you don't become an angel. Angels were made <clears throat> a little lower than man. Man was made in the very image and likeness of God. Angels were not. Number six, you will still be you. In heaven, you will still be you. Sometimes we ask, and sometimes we are asked the question, will we know each other in heaven? Now, I will tell you honestly that I, <clears throat> I have friends who are on both sides of that, that, that question. Some would answer that with a yes, and some would answer that with no. For me, I'll tell you honestly, I am firmly in the yes column about that. If you ask me if I think we're going to know each other in heaven, I believe that absolutely and unequivocally that will be the case. I believe that for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is 1 Thessalonians 2 and beginning in verse number 19, where Paul said, what is our hope? What is our crown? of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And so he seems to imply that beyond this earth, we're going to know each other, that he's going to know those individuals, that he had taught the gospel and they are there because of his teaching. Sometimes I wonder what would be the point if we're just surrounded by strangers. And I know the question that is always raised is, well, but Don, won't we miss people who aren't there? And here's the answer to that. I don't know. And I don't care. I really don't. The fact of the matter is, what did the Bible ask multiple times? Is anything too hard for God? Don't you believe that God can resolve that issue? Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I've got selective memory now because of age. I figure God can work that out in eternity. So I don't worry about that. So I come down on the yes side of that, but you will still be you. However, you also will be different. There will be something about you that will be different. I know that's true because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye. Well, we will be changed. Well, what are we, what's it gonna be? What are we gonna look like? How's that, how's all that gonna work out? I don't know the answer to that. John said in 1 John 3 and beginning in verse 2, Beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, other than we shall be like him when he appears. We will be resurrected never to die again. We're going to be changed. We're not going to, I believe firmly, we're not going to, I'm not going to need these glasses anymore to be able to see. You may not, if you were, you're not going to need a hearing aid anymore. You'll not need a walker. You'll not be a cane, need a cane. We just, we just don't know about those things. Although, I will tell you, I am pretty sure that all the men are going to have very distinguished white mustaches. I think that's probably going, to be, probably going to be the case. Number eight, time will be no more. We sing about that in our churches. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. Where do we get that idea? Well, we got that idea from the Bible. We got that idea from Genesis 1 that says that God set the sun and the moon in their place for the demarcation of days and nights. And in heaven, in Revelation 21 and 23, <clears throat> those elements, the sun and moon, are no longer, no longer there. And time will be no more. No more time, no more running late, no more rushing to be somewhere, no more checking the clock, no more checking the calendar. Time will be no more. Number nine. We won't be tempted anymore. I'm really happy about that, aren't you? There'll be no temptation in heaven. You say, well, Don, how do you know that? I know that from Revelation 20 and verse 10, that the devil is going to be cast along with his angels 
into the lake of fire. And so we are going to be where he is not. And so there'll be no more temptation, no more deception, no more sin. And then number 10, we'll not miss, we'll not miss our old lives. I don't think we'll miss our lives on earth at all. In fact, in Philippians 1 and verse 23, Paul, when he was saying, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Not quite sure whether I'm going to live or die just yet. He said in verse 23, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ because that would be far better. And I've said from this pulpit many times, literally it is, that would be, to use his language, very much far better. Every negative thing to which we were exposed in this life, whether in your personal life or whether, whether in your interaction with others or just when you watch the evening news, none of that is going to be in heaven. I can only imagine. But there are a lot of things about heaven beyond these 10 <clears throat> that we can know. If you're taking notes right there in the margin of your Bible as to why we ought to set our mind on things above, let me give you a couple of things just to jot down. We have sung for generations in our churches an old hymn that talks about the wonderful city of God. In the book of Revelation, you have an introduction in chapter 1, and you have letters to churches in chapters 2 and 3. But the Revelation itself actually begins in chapter 4, verse 1, the way our Bibles are divided. And it's interesting that 4 and 1 begins, the apocalypse actually begins with the curtain of heaven being rolled back. And the very first thing that John sees is that God is still in heaven. And so it says it in things like this, chapter 4, you are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. The very first things he sees in the great throne scene of chapter 4 is that our God is there. He is our Lord and our God. In chapter 5, it's the Lamb, the Lamb who is to be praised and honored and given glory and power forever and ever. And the point of that is that God the Father and God the Son are in heaven. In chapter 7 of the Revelation, salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Here's the point of that, ladies and gentlemen. We have spent our lifetimes praying to God, singing to God, talking about God, converting the lost to God, bowing our heads before God, following God. But in heaven, we get to actually be with God. Again, John 14 and 2, that's what Jesus said. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. That's the essence of heaven. The essence of heaven is not is not the accommodative language about a street of gold or a gate of pearl where John was trying to use language that we could wrap our, our finite minds around. That's not the essence of heaven. The essence of heaven is that God is there. Now listen to me carefully, please. Let me say this as kindly as I can and yet as clearly as I can. If being with God now doesn't mean anything to you, doesn't mean much to you, then it probably is not going to mean much to you in heaven. Revelation 22, beginning in verse number three. The throne of God and the Lamb shall be there. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name will be upon them. They shall see his face. That's an important statement about heaven because you're a good Bible student. You know that there are the statements in the Bible. For example, God to Moses, where Moses said, I'd like to see you. And God says, you can't. If you see me, you will die. And so you can't. But in heaven, we get to see the face of God. Seeing the face of someone for the first time is an important thing, isn't it? If you're a gentleman in this audience who was married, can you remember back <clears throat> when you stood maybe in front of an audience very much like this, and you were a nervous groom, and you stood in the front of all these people, and there you stood, and you looked back, and for the first time, you saw your bride in her wedding dress? You remember the first time that you, that you had placed in your arms your firstborn child, and you looked into the face of your firstborn baby? All of that so special. In heaven, we get to see the face of God. Job put it this way. My eyes shall see him and not another. No wonder it's the city of God. I want to say one other thing about that before we leave this, if I may. 
In the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, John says, There is no temple in heaven, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Have you ever thought about what that means? What, why did God say that? Why was it important for John to write that down so that on this day in July of 2021 in Temple Terrace, Florida, we could read that? What did God want us to learn from that? There is no temple there. Because you see, it's interesting, the temple represented the presence of God. And so you would think it would be there, wouldn't you? Because the temple represented presence of God. He dwelt in the Holy of Holy. But have you ever thought about the fact that the temple also represented separation from God? Have you ever thought about, listen to me now, that the temple also represented separation from God? There were multiple courtyards in the temple and your gender and your nationality and your heritage determined how close you could get to God. The Gentiles could not go beyond the court of the Gentiles. The women could not go beyond the court of women. The average, ordinary, everyday Jew could certainly not go into the most holy of holies. The unclean could not enter the temple compound at all. Samaritans could not enter the temple area. But in heaven, the point of it is, there's no separation between man and God. And you're there, not just, you don't just get to walk by in a receiving line and get to shake his hand and take a quick picture with him. The Bible uses the word dwell with him. For years we've sung in our churches the hymn, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Where'd we get that idea? Well, again, we got that idea from the Bible, from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, and verse 9. Listen to this. After these things I looked, and behold, there was a great multitude, which no one could number, of all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed with white robes, and they had palm branches in their hands. I want you to listen to that carefully, ladies and gentlemen, and hear what God is saying. Not just a few. But people from the length and breadth of this globe, people of every nation and language and every race, because there is no respect of persons with God, and so there should not be with us. Godly people are there, simple people, famous people, poor people. The common thread is that these were men and women who walked by faith and lived with obedience to God. When Jesus said, Matthew 22 and 37, come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's exactly what they did. To use Bible language, these were the ones, Revelation 20 and verse 11, who had their names written in the Lamb's book of life. These were the ones, Matthew 7, who are considered wise because they built their house upon the rock. And these are those who, according to Matthew 6, who understand having been forgiven by God, they forgive others and being loved by God, they in turn will love others. The Hebrew writer was talking and, and he said similar things. You come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn ones whose names have been written in heaven. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we'll probably be surprised by some folks who are there. And we'd probably be surprised by some folks who aren't there. But John in the Revelation says, you know what, I, I'm, I'm standing in the midst of an innumerable group of people of every nation and tongue and race and tribe and people. And they all, they all came to God with a past. But they all live for him in their present. And because of that, this is their future. And again, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this as kindly and yet as clearly as I know how to say it. If being with the people of God now doesn't mean very much to you, then it's probably not going to mean much to you in heaven either. And finally, in our churches, we have sung about the home of the soul. Home of the soul. Again, in Revelation 4 and 1, the, the apocalypse really begins with <clears throat> these words, come up here 
and I will show you. And we said the reason it begins that way, the reason John had to come up there is because nothing compares here with what he is going to see there. I think you reach a point in your life where you, you look back and you begin to reflect on things and you, you have perspective that you didn't have in the days of your youth. I was thinking about that this week as I <clears throat> marked another birthday off the calendar. and I was thinking about growing up in California where I did. I, the, the years that I remember in California when I was a boy, the last place we lived are the years where I really began to kind of understand what was going on in, in my world. And, and I was old enough, I was old enough to understand the things that I was studying in school and that I enjoyed very much in school. I've all, I always loved school very much. But I, I thought back this week that when I was a boy growing up and living in this tiny little desert community in California, that basically was the end of the world squared. I could have never imagined getting to see some of the things that I've seen in the world. It was incomprehensible to me. The, the, very, the very thought of being able to travel outside of really the state that I was in, much less the country in which I lived, in, in my young mind was, was unimaginable. And I was thinking this week about some of the things that God has allowed me to see. I, I've seen the, the Atlantic on one coast and the Pacific on the other. I've, I've seen the Mediterranean. I've seen the Aegean Sea. I've, I've seen the Colorado Rockies and I've seen the Swiss Alps. I've seen the White House in Washington and the Kremlin in Moscow. I've seen the castles of Europe and I've seen the Temple Mound in Jerusalem. But I would tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I am firmly persuaded that there is nothing, that there is not one single thing that human eyes will see on this earth that compares with what John saw in heaven and what we will one day see. Joe's teaching an excellent class on Sunday afternoons at five o'clock out of the book of Joshua. And he told in one of the early classes about Moses, about Moses wanting to enter the promised land. And God's saying, no, I'm, I, I'm not going to let you do that. But he said, I will do this. And so he took him, he took him to a panoramic place where, where he could see, where he could see much that Israel, his children, his people were going, were going to inherit. And Moses wanted it so bad. And so he asked God repeatedly. And finally God said, look, don't ask me anymore. But he said, I'm going to let you see. I'm going to give you a glimpse. Can you imagine getting a tour of Canaan by its creator? Can you imagine God saying to Moses, Moses, look over here. You see, you see, that, you see that water tributary? That, that's going to provide water for your children. You see that land over there? That, that land is going to be fertile. And it's going to feed your children. You see those hills? Those hills are going to provide protection from your enemies. And there Moses was, ladies and gentlemen, facing the end of his life, but seeing, as it were, the future. And like Moses, we do the same. We, we sing about that. We sing about so many songs in our fellowship about heaven. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Oh, they tell me of a home over there. Won't it be wonderful? there and that's what john is given in the revelation just like moses only john's allowed to get a glimpse of heaven i've wondered many times what john felt when he realized the vision was ending and he was back to life on this earth when that reality began to settle in on him I wonder what he felt. I think probably, ladies and gentlemen, that he understood that it's one thing. It's one thing to know that there's a hope, but it's another thing altogether to know that that hope is actually yours. And I would imagine from that day forward, John was never the same. <clears throat> Over the past several years, 
here in Tampa Bay, but also in another state, I've had the privilege of, of emceeing some dinners where I've been allowed to meet some political figures who were speaking and sports figures who were speaking <clears throat> and individuals from other walks of life who've made a mark that is just amazing. And one of those about five years ago was in the state of Alabama. It was a dinner <clears throat> to raise funds for a foundation in honor of uh, a brother-in-law of mine who passed away in his 50s. He was killed in a tragic, tragic accident. And he was, he was a very successful businessman, but he was also a very, very generous man, particularly for children. The amount of money that he gave quietly, anonymously, under the table, never wanted anybody to know about, was just inestimable. And when he died in the accident, his family formed a foundation in his honor. <clears throat> and it carries on that legacy. It carries on that work. And at one of the dinners that I was emceeing for that, the guest speaker was Sean Alexander. Sean Alexander played football at, <clears throat> at Alabama, and of course he was an All-American there. He's in their College Football Hall of Fame. He was drafted as the 19th player in the draft by the Seattle Seahawks, and he had just an amazing career there. In 2005, he was the MVP of the league. He just had an amazing career. He was an amazing athlete. And as I sat at the table and I got to talk with him, I sat by him and we got, we got to talk a little bit. I was so impressed with him, so impressed about with what he was talking about. And when he, and when he got up to spoke, <clears throat> Sean Alexander has 10 children. And in everything that he does, he talks about his faith. He talks about God and he talks about his faith. And in his, in his speech that night, <clears throat> he got to talking about his grandmother. And he began talking about the profound impact that his grandmother had had on his life in helping to raise him. His mom and dad were divorced when he was very young. And so his mother and his grandmother were two great influences in his life. And he got to talking about his grandmother's faith. And he said that his grandmother had died just not very long before that evening. And when he heard that she was in her last days, he immediately traveled to go be with her and when he saw her when he when he when he saw her he said he began to cry and he hugged her and held her and told her how much he loved her and he said my grandmother looked at me and she said Sean don't don't cry for me and here's what she said I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I know where I'm going. And I want to ask you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, can you say those three things? It's one thing to know that there's a hope out there. It's another thing altogether to be able to sing and mean Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And if you this morning need to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ or come home to your father, this invitation's for you. Let's stand and let's. Sing.